Um, to preface the discussion on creative uh, connections, um, it is increasingly recognized that art as a series of guiding principles and means of communication can be harnessed to improve the creation and, de and design and delivery of socially innovative ideas by connecting individuals. Creative Connections focuses on the role in building connections on an individual, group, and societal level. And as to repeat today's discussion, uh, micro, meso, and macro levels. In a world where individuality is often prioritized at the expense of the community, art becomes a shared language through which we can foster dialogue and build uh, disciplines. Art is important for social change insofar as, one, it provides a collective and safe space to problemize and examine issues through, creative, through the creative lens. And number two, it catalyzes awareness through aesthetic and I would say non-rational channels. This panel examines the iterative artistic processes aimed at strengthening communities and cultivating lasting social engagement. So to begin, and I, I'd like to address the two questions, uh, one to Sean and then another one to Justin. And in, in this area, the umbrella of the theme that we wanted to talk about was defining art. And the question would be, how do you define art? Why are artists important uh, to society? So Sean, your work with um, Wessagetti's with a mandate to support art and artists for social transformation. How do you define art in your organization? Uh, so, so we actually don't spend very much time talking about the definition of art per se, uh, but, it, but actually looking more at the relationship between art and the rest of society. So particularly we're interested in artistic practice, the idea that artists uh, have a practice that is also focused on uh, and its basis in historical narratives, therefore memory, uh, and then of course thinking about that within the frame of, of poetry, of, of the metaphorical, of the spaces in between, of the imagination and so on. And, uh, and within that then we think about the imagination as being, say in the words of Roberto Unger, a Brazilian philosopher, um, that the imagination is the scout of the will. And so if you think about our capacity to look at the world around us, to perceive the world around us, and and, uh, and and see what is, that also then situates us to think about what can be. Uh, and that is the process of social evolution. And so when we think about how we transform society through the arts, I think it's about both um, creating new capacities for perception of the world around us, and then new capacities to reimagine what that world uh, can be. So for Musa Geddes, as a, as a philanthropic uh, arts foundation, we work um, with artists doing artistic practices in relation to all aspects of our society uh, in especially small cities with the goal of looking for um, new forms for the world. How, what can we learn from uh, places of difference um, across, uh, across the world, really? So I can talk about more of those things uh, later. Great, thanks so much. So Justin, I'd like you to continue on with this conversation. Um, you believe in the power of art to affect everyday life and civic engagement. As an educator and social organizer, how do you define art and, and the role of the artist? Sure. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, the, so the refrain is gonna be, it's hard to define art and, you know, and how do we actually get around this idea of discussing impact and, and uh, they're good questions to be asking, but I think that I might start um, by drawing on like Nato Thompson, uh, the chief curator, creative time and saying that maybe art isn't really the right framing for where we are in this moment and it's actually about trying to talk about cultural production because that's sort of uh, what we're up against is a bunch of other interests producing culture for us. So maybe that's a, a good starting place because of some other footholds. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that part of what that also like leads into is trying to find, um, you know, the role of the artist is, I think, asking like, well, what if? So an artist in a studio course, you know, the training is like, well, what if I painted a green triangle on this canvas? Um, you know, maybe it's also about like asking, what if I brought these people together for a different conversation? And the idea that like artists in in training can kind of like think about asking, uh, you know, asking through a different way around the problem, 
is really key because it's not like, how can I make this green triangle for somebody else? It's how can I make a green, green triangle because I want to see one. And so I think that when we talk about art or cultural production as like really only focused on trying to do something for other people, I think that's uh, maybe actually a really violent supposition, but also a really uh, kind of boring one because I'm more interested in like, I want to paint the green triangle because I think that that's what should be. And my capacity to ask what if there should be a green triangle on a canvas extends into like, well, what if the world were uh, made a little bit differently for like a moment? Darren O'Donnell, somewhere in that uh, video last night, was talking about these, you know, these kind of like micro gestures or sort of like micro adjustments. And I think this is really the case. But the point is that we can all have a capacity to do that, and not that I'm you know, as an artist trying to do something for you, but that like I'm trying to maybe like create a micro gesture in which you can find some resonance and then make your own micro gesture. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, the next topic that we were going to move into is art and social change, and I would like to ask Vera to speak towards this. How can art be a powerful tool in uh, social change? Well, I can speak directly from yeah, I can speak from my experience uh, as an activist and as an artist, or as a person pretending to be an artist to, to get the stuff that I wanted to get done, done. Um, <laughs> so when I joined uh, Known as Illegal, a migrant justice organization in Toronto um, over a decade ago, we were curious about the conditions that migrant detainees were facing inside the immigration jail in Rexdale. And so we went to the Canada Border Services Agency and we told them we were art students interested in art as a means of therapy, meditation, and relaxation for stressed out detainees. And they let us in to do a bi-weekly <laughs> art group. Um, and so when we were in there as arts educators, we actually did more learning than we did teaching. We learned about the conditions inside the detention center. We learned that women um, were there because they had survived sexual assault and went to the police to report it. And instead of providing them with support, they turned them into immigration. Um, we learned that abusive employers, landlords were doing the same. We learned that service providers, um, when faced with people who were undocumented, sometimes reported them to immigration. And so these stories told through the art form the basis for campaigns uh, that have taken place at the city level. And the art, uh, you can say, was a spark or a catalyst, if you will, uh, for movements to push immigration enforcement out of city sites and spaces. Um, it was a catalyst to seeing the border as not just this line in the sand between countries, but actually something that gets enact enacted all across the city and that we're all implicated in. And so when we started organizing campaigns to stop deportations and being public about what we were seeing, uh, the Canada Border Services Agency quickly realized we weren't pacifying detainees as we said we would, but we were actually <laughs> supporting their resistance. And it's in the same spirit of resistance that um, I founded and co-directed and worked with an awesome team of friends and fellow activists to organize Mass Arrival, a project that intervenes in uh, the discourse, the extremely violent discourse surrounding migrant illegality in Canada. And I won't, I won't talk about that, but I think that art can be a tool for social change when, like our goal with the art group was never to secure funding or make it a prolonged thing. We knew we'd get in and we'd get kicked out at some point. Our goal was to do political work. So when we're talking about social change, uh, it's necessary to outline the power structures that exist. Right now, we are on stolen indigenous land. What does that mean for us as artists? We are in a country that is built on the exclusion and the exploitation of migrant workers. And that is ongoing. So what does it mean for us to talk about social change? It, it requires um, looking at our own social location, the sites and the institutions and the spaces that we're in, and the resources that we have access to, to 
to intervene in power in a way that um, can create systemic change. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sean, I'd like you to address uh, how can art be a powerful t tool in uh, social change? And, Sean, just to preface this, um, your work in uh, art in public spaces to address social issues, um, sorry, you use work in art uh, in public spaces. Uh, what is your goal of art when it is no longer in the gallery? And I think this is a key point right now that I'd like you to t touch upon, but when it intervenes with, even disrupts public space, uh, what does art facilitate that other disciplines may not have? Um, is this, yeah, it's working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, so working in public space um, provides a lot of opportunities to reach uh, a different kind of audience, I think, uh, because mm -hmm. in the galleries, people are uh, going there intentionally, and generally uh, it's a gallery-going audience. Not everybody feels comfortable entering a gallery or museum space, and uh, it can be a bit of uh, preaching to the choir. Um, so working in public spaces where uh, the, the art or intervention isn't expected mm -hmm. um, can not just reach uh, a different audience, but an audience that's uh, directly invested in those those spaces, those sites, and mm -hmm. so with the type of work I do, it's generally the work isn't just located in those sites, but it's uh, it's about the sites as well. It's about the public spaces, and um, so being able to to create something directly in that space is is really important. I think um, now I, I I think work in galleries is important too. Like I'm not I'm not saying we should give up one for the other. Um, we need all different kinds of approaches, and, and, and not just from art as well. I mean, uh, we were talking about how art has very loose definition, especially these days, but uh, I don't think it should be uh, necessarily privileged over other disciplines, that even um, over, you know, that creative discipline should be created, um, should be privileged over non-creative disciplines, because we kind of need, um, change to come from all different directions and all different scales, so from bottom up and top down and everything in between. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, one, one thing that came up earlier was about, you know, working in communities versus individual efforts. And um, even there, I think, you know, we shouldn't discourage people from making their own individual efforts as well. That's sometimes that's the best way people can uh, function. You know, that's, that's their wheelhouse. Um, and it's all the little things put together that add up, right? So, of course, we do need the, the larger communal efforts, and, and those are extremely important, perhaps most important, but we also need all those little individual efforts, too. Mm -hmm. Great, great, that was great. Thank you so much. That actually leads us into the next set of questions, which is uh, the theme of art and people. Um, and the question is, how do we connect people to art? And Hasid, I think you're probably very helpful here to talk about this, especially as uh, you are a producer and curator of public art festivals and projects. What are the considerations that are going into curating work uh, for a public art audience? What are the responsibilities do artists have to their audiences? Um, who? Test? Because uh, just before I do answer that, I just want to say Mass Arrival was an amazing project. I absolutely loved it. It was so cool. Um, so my day job is I work as a programmer for Scotiabank Nuit Blanche, and I've worked in festivals, public art festivals, from all my career. Um, but I don't want to approach it from the lens of festivals. Festivals are kind of weird things. They create sort of destination audiences, and so public is not a really good thing to analyze when you think in the context of festivals. What I'm interested in is public art and public space, and essentially temporary public art. Um, and to answer, the, and generally similar to Sean, um, I usually think about the what, the reasoning, and the criteria when I'm putting up the signage. You know, I put the signage up, I'm like, what exactly was this supposed to be in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, but the only thing, the only criteria that I take into account when curating and producing public art projects is this idea of physical proximity. That's the only criteria that I go with, is this notion of 
what is the proximity of this project to the physical public space that people occupy? Is the day-to-day -day life. I often tell cur poor curators and artists who work with me um, that I want your projects to occupy the same space as orange juice, eggs, milk, groceries, parking, advertising, candy bars. That is the psychic, social, geographical, physical space that your projects occupy. And thinking in the materiality of that is essentially the only thing I think a project should do. I think it's important for me to emphasize personally, and to Justin's point, is that I don't conflate physical proximity with accessibility. Personally, I'm not interested in projects being accessible to people. What I'm interested in is that conversation that happens when you occupy the same space. That's what's mm -hmm. interesting as a project. Mm -hmm. That's what artists can do and the public that comes to do with it. Um, and finally, ultimately, just the last part of that question, you know, what should artists think about and what's their responsibility to their audience? Um, I don't think, again, there's a responsibility to an audience because the, who is that audience? It's composed of both yourself, people who know you very well, people who don't know you very well. And I'm, again, quite skeptical of this assumption of framing who an audience is. Um, I was just recently thinking, when I was seeing the, thinking about the question, I thought of a project uh, with an artist collector that I'm working with currently, and uh, they're called Tercero Quinto from Mexico, Mexico City, which stands for three out of five. Um, and they did this incredible project um, in the power plant to, in 2005, where the show was about, I think, access, audiences, people, and all they did was essentially install um, a back door into the gallery. So it was a clear mirrored back door, and that's it. No signage saying, this museum is open for you to go, nothing, it was just a door. And if you, by chance, happen to pass by and open the door, you can go into the gallery. There's no front desk, no security, no nothing. You're in the gallery. <laughs> and it was open for the whole summer. Um, so I think things like that, this notion where you're not trying to outreach and tell people you should access museums, you should actually just do something, but you occupy that space, um, is kind of the criteria by which I would um, curate. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. So I think this is a question for all of you because it is going to go under the umbrella of impact. Um, and I think today's speakers were starting to address different kinds of impact and, um, and it depends on where you are. Like are you the curator, are you the artist, are you the participant? And I think these conversations still need to be had. As, I mean, I think they're gonna be difficult. Um, but l let me preface it. Um, what kind of impact have you seen from your work can you tell us more about how you determine that impact? Um, and I'll continue this. There's an increasing emphasis on asking for quantifiable and measurable impact in the arts. For example, it is co common to qualify how artists contribute to economic growth. How should artists respond when asked to prove the impact of their artistic pra practice? Uh, is, there, is this problematic? How, how do we ensure that artists and artworks are properly recognized for their contribution. So I feel like these are kind of really heavy questions and they can be broken apart. So we'll just open it up to everyone and you can just jump in where you feel comfortable. Okay. Well, I could uh, jump in right away. Good, uh, thank you. Uh, the impact question is always the dreaded question. Yeah. It, it's the one that <laughs> yeah. nobody wants to talk about. Um, and for good reason. Uh, picking up on what Assad said about uh, art in relation to people's everyday lives. There was a, mm -hmm. the, the great American pragmatist philosopher, John Dewey, the Dewey Decimal System guy, uh, wrote Art as Experience, a, a book, I think it was in the 30s that he wrote it. And in there, he talks about art being about the ordinary lives of ordinary people. And I know the ordinary people in Canada now has a whole Harper rhetoric around it, but if you go back to his early concept, it's really about the quotidian. So to ask about the impact of the arts is just like asking somebody the impact of getting out of bed in the morning. Um, and, and we know that it's significant, that it's important, that it's vital, uh, and, and, and so on. But in terms of actually being able to measure it, how do we measure 
social evolution. Uh, and I think that many of the, the forms of this that we can draw from social science and, and all this, and many experiments have been done, uh, we've done a bit with developmental evaluation um, in, in looking at uh, the relation that a group of participants in an artistic project will have over time to that. Our Sense Lab project was an extension out of that, a, a form of cultural mediation and such. So to, to answer all of that, we th think um, less about impact and more about the ethics of the work that we do. And to interrogate constantly um, a lot of the questions actually that Judith brought up um, in her talk about, well, who profits from it? Um, how are we entering a community? How are we exiting a community? Who are we bringing into the discourse? Um, you know, acknowledging the land uh, that we're on, acknowledging that there are incredible things that, uh, that we can learn from the queer community, from the indigenous community, all these sorts of things. So impact starts to recede in importance for us. So my favorite um, performance scholar and um, anti-colonial playwright and theorist, Ngugi Wathiango, he talks about art as conscious dreaming. And if it is indeed conscious dreaming, um, how can we quantify or measure that, echoing what Sean just said? I think the power of art, when it's on the side of social justice, lies in its power to ask questions. And when we're asked to measure or quantify um, the, the impact of our work, that, that intervenes in the artist's imagination, or it inter intervenes in mine, certainly. If I'm thinking about how to secure funding for my next project by applying to different grants and talking about social impact, that's going to that's going to infringe on the types of questions I'm able to ask. And then the art project automatically becomes shaped in a particular way. So um, I would encourage us to think about art as a, a space for collaborative dreaming, conscious dreaming, uh, um, creating spaces, collaborative spaces where we can imagine the kind of world that we want to live in. And I'm not sure that that can be um, determined ahead of time what the impact of that is. Uh, if we want our work to be contagious, if we want social justice and social change to be contagious, then uh, our goal should be for to approach it in a way that it might have ripple effects that are so big we can't measure it. Um, to answer the question, uh, the I wanted to talk about two points, one positive and one sort of ambivalent, essentially. Uh, on the positive side, it's, it's interestingly the festivals that have been quite interesting in terms of um, what I've noticed with large festivals and large public art things is they generate a kind of mythology about possibility. That's really interesting that I've gone to so many other places where they want to do a big project and usually either I will say it or someone else will say, oh, it's like Nuit Blanche, right? And I'm like, yeah, exactly, like Nuit Blanche. And it's interesting, because what is that specific specificity? So there's this myth that spreads about something that can be generative, which can be really interesting on one level. Um, but on the flip side, um, I've been very fortunate to be uh, working on this experimental festival together with uh, Cindy Roseboom, other in the corner, and Eastern Arts on called Art the Danforth. We've been revisiting a neighborhood again and again and again, um, and doing public art projects in that space. Um, and Cindy, you can beat me up later when I say this. Um, but one of the things we noticed um, after the, one, of, one of the iterations was the beginnings of, uh, of a gentrification, because we're doing all these public art projects in a neighborhood that was not, that was kind of quiet and dark at night, especially. Um, and it, it's hard to draw the link between your work and changing economies. However, I have proof. The proof was a, a Goldman Mail article in the real estate section shortly after we had finished the first, that festival where someone bought a new house. It was like the house of the week. And the guy was like, oh yeah, I came here um, to this neighborhood in the Danforth doing this R the Danforth festival. And it seems like a great neighborhood. So he bought up this building you know, and kicked out the Filipino community church that was there. Has like nice paneled you know, wood floor, frosted glass. And I had a moment, I remember calling Cindy saying, what have we done? You know, <laughs> you know like we were trying to engage in a neighborhood because we were interested in that neighborhood. We were interested in that psychic geography. And then people come by and they think it's so great and they start every single store, 
that we engaged in, every single store we opened up, ended up becoming soap shops and bars and coffee shops. And I don't wanna, I wanna knock that, right? People have a right to, ge to generate and create their own economy. However, um, I was quite ambivalent about the role we as public art and cultural producers have within that, because what are you displacing in that process? Yeah, I, I would could echo what everybody's been saying here. I think there's um, a real danger in setting it as uh, a requirement for, for granting. Um, but as uh, individuals and as organizations, I think it's important for us to be critical of our own practices and what we're putting out there and try to assess it in whatever way works for us to try to see what kind of impact we're having. And also to imagine what impact we will have before we put something out there in, into public space. Um, with uh, working in public space, I've been very fortunate in, in being able to get reactions directly, you know, as I'm working uh, or once I've put something out there. And uh, sometimes it's clear during the process, you know, when working with a community, then you're, you're kind of seeing the impact as you're working on it. And then with other projects where, you know, building in the studio beforehand and then putting it out into public space, you get the reaction after it's been installed. Um, one that was really uh, maybe the most impactful uh, reaction that I ever had was uh, related to the uh, nature project, which was in the video shown yesterday, and actually, I guess, showing it behind that curtain there. But um, one of the people who uh, saw that piece came up to me about a week later saying that they had been talking about it ever since, and, and because it was in front of their house, they felt like it was somehow for them specifically. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they'd gone out and uh, bought a green bin and started you know, composting and, and bought, uh, forcing their roommates to recycle like crazy and started recycling more mm -hmm. themselves. And so to actually hear that impact like that has had on somebody's behavior is not something you always get to have. Uh, so. I never dare to expect it. It's something I always hope for, um, but to actually hear it is is really you know encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like I said, I think that's that's one advantage again of working in a public environment is you get to interact with people directly. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think our grants should be required to that we have you know bring that kind of information because you, it's not always that concrete that you have a cause and effect. Um, that's that's kind of the rare thing when you can, and it's going to be different every time. You know, it won't be that situation every time. It might be you know somebody going out and making their own artwork or or doing something totally different. You might not even hear about it yourself because the impacts you know can ripple out. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's important to consider both negative and positive consequences of what we do. And too often, I think artists like to play the artist card of kind of like, well, you know, uh, I can do what I want. It doesn't really matter what the impact is once I put it out there because I'm an artist and I, I think artists have just as much responsibility as anybody else out there and so if you're putting something out into the world, it's no longer just yours but you still have that initial responsibility for having been the one to, to put it there. Mm -hmm. So, but what if my responsibility as an artist was not to like worry about other people but to think, <laughs> right, but, but to think like, okay, so if I really, care about like democracy and justice then like it's not about me like making a moment for somebody else it's about me like trying to create the space for other people to do whatever they want and like a more democratic society where we can all encounter like the world with a sense of antagonism that like enables us to act or inspires us to act and then we create the right uh, hopefully mechanisms that can uh, allow people to act within that is like a lot more interesting than me trying to like hold a space for a bunch of other people. But, and I know that's not really what you were saying, but because I think that like responsibility for sure is, uh, is kind of like a self check-in in a way to make sure that you're not doing something uh, maybe really explicitly violent. But I think that like there's so many ways that we build into what we're already doing a lot of like kind of troubling uh, aspects of uh, human social conduct that it's like um, to kind of to try and privilege that under art doesn't make a lot of interesting sense to me it's kind of like we just need to be working all the time for making more space for uh, one another to do things that we want to do the you know the other thing about like the idea of um, of impact and I mean the, the work that I did with Broken City Lab um, the impact was like 
Well, we were in our 20s, and uh, it really made us feel like we could give a shit about where we lived, and we had a sense of ownership and a sense of agency over the city. Like, that's it. I mean, if there were resonances with other people, that's a bonus, but it was never the intention to, like, go out and, like, try and rally a bunch of people together, because it was really, like, it was about you trying to understand your place in the city, and, and that was kind of it. So the idea of measuring impact against if you would have said, we want to inspire the guy across the road to like start composting, like I don't know if the project would have ever been this great nature work, right? So I think the challenge of addressing impact of thinking about this stuff you know, is, is sort of when we're assuming that it's supposed to do something other than for yourself. Yeah, I guess my, my point around that was, yeah, it wasn't so much that you have to do work. Like I don't think artists should be forced to do work that is uh, you know, changing somebody else's actions, for example. Uh, but just to say that we have just as much responsibility as any other person out there, right? So like if, if in empowering yourselves you were directly hurting other people, that's something you should be conscious of. I don't, I'm not saying that you were, but I'm saying that that's the kind of thing you have to be critical about. And, and you can't just play the artist card and saying, oh, we're just being artists so we can you know, run rampant. Yeah, um, but I want everybody <laughs> to run rampant. Right, right. Well, if that's your goal, then... then and that's what you achieved, but you were saying that wasn't your goal. You're saying that you guys were doing it for yourselves, right? Yeah, yeah. But I don't want people to run rampant with me. I want them all. To, I want everybody else to have the capacity to do it. Right. So, in being critical about your practice, you got to think like, okay, if that's my goal, has it done that? Right. Yeah. So that's part of the self-assessment. So whatever you're trying to achieve, you can't just assume that that's happening. It's kind of, actually, Darren mentioned it in the video is like we shouldn't assume that the things that we're doing are are making good change just because we've done them. We have to not necessarily have like strict metrics, but we should be self-critical about what we're doing and, and you know, try to see if it's actually doing what we're hoping it's, you know, what we're trying to make it do. And not having other detrimental consequences that we're just ignoring on the side necessarily, you know? Not that you can always predict that or they can always prevent it, but we sh you know, you have to be aware. I think questions of accountability um, are important. And I know I started off by saying impact, which it's not that important to think about, but actually I do think it is. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm working on a project, like I had this idea to ask migrant farm workers if the fruits and vegetables you grow and pick could speak from dinner tables, refrigerators, and grocery aisles, what would you want it to say? And I wanted to execute public art interventions um, based on this question by engaging with migrant farm workers in southern Ontario. Now, I could just sit here and think it's a great idea, but there might be a lot of different implications. Um, it might not be useful project to try and waste people's time with. Um, I'm kind of going to, going to farms and asking people to be part of it. So there's a part of me that's selling this idea um, to, to workers. So it's important for me to uh, develop partnerships with migrant worker advocates, people who've had those relationships for a long period of time, and ask them what they think about it. Doesn't mean now the project is gonna turn into a publicity campaign for the organization, but um, it's, it's this back and forth, it's a connection and a conversation. Hey, I have this question and I think um, it would be interesting to answer this question through art. Do you think that could be useful for your work? I don't need to know how it could be useful necessarily, but if you find it useful for your work, then let's, let's partner on it, you can participate in it, and use, use this art project, use this collaborative platform that uh, I'm working to create to engage with publics around the campaigns and the demands and the political work that you're trying to do. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think these are great conversations. Um, just uh, listening to Judith speak about the impact in her terms is like micro, meso, and macro. And it's in some ways just listening to you now, everyone has a different way at what level they're going to engage and you know, is it within the community? Is it my own work? And I'm, and whatever the repercussions of what happens if someone does something, like, you know, Sean, your piece, just sitting there, and then something happens, and it's great. And then, and then the, the the art on the Danforths and the mass arrival, having all these 
whole people running into responding and reacting to something. I, it is like setting up those scenarios. And I think how much is it the artist is thinking about, you know, creating that space, be it, be, be it a small space at the individual level as a group level. And I yeah. think there are, I think impact's always going to be there. I mean, how one documents it or how one talks about it uh, is, is going to be the challenge, or how the grant agencies ask, how are you going to talk about impact, rather than can, can the artist say, can it come from the artist saying this was the impact, and share it in, from that way, rather than a very formulaic, like did you see 400, were 400 people at this event type of thing. But yeah, those numbers something. can be faked. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> off the record, sorry. <laughs> but um, but I, something that just struck me as you um, and you're asking this question and connecting it with uh, with Judith's talk as well, Oops. and I don't know if this makes sense. So and it kind of clear me out if I'm not making sense here. Is like there's something about you. You have to kind of expand this definition of what your material is as an artist. Because I don't know if you're treating it as a discrete thing that you're an artist and this is your material. Like is the material the structure of the boat or is it the actual carpet you use for nature? Or is the material something a bit more ineffable? Because the responsibility of artists often lie within, the, within that work, right? Within what that material is. But the definition of that material can be more open and more connected to, again, physical space, right? Uh, all the other areas of intentionality, impact, I would posit that it's not the artist's responsibility to actually deal. I think there's a personal responsibility as a human being functioning not in a vacuum on this planet. Right? If you're doing work and you're doing things, you have personal responsibilities. But when you're working, um, your, your responsibility is to your tools, to your materials, and how you work with them, and how they mean, and how they sort of show what it is that you want to do, and express your ideas. It's just the definition of that material can be physical space, can be that moment where the garbage, the garbage truck guy shows up and picks up these things that are thinking and drops them in. There's the materiality of that project there. Um, and so that would be my position. I'm not sure if it's so clear. I mean, uh, to me, I just wonder about like what, like a neoliberal capitalist world that we live in doesn't have any sense of responsibility to us. Like, why are we concerned about like policing ourselves against these things that like we imagine are supposed to be important? Like, I could say the response, you know, like, did you cross the line when you subjected somebody to seeing an artwork? Well, I don't know. I mean, like, it, it, I just feel it's more important to be considering like how can we create the conditions under which like everyone has the capacity to address the world on their terms and not be worried so much about like exactly how other people are seeing what we're doing because i think that's a that's a way that we're already constricting what it is we think we do and in the context of this symposium like th there's a different conversation if we think we're giving an artist talk or if we're doing something else but in the context of this space for a wider variety of people in the room it's like i'm interested in trying to say Maybe if we talk about like social innovation and impact, maybe there's just a different conversation that we want to have together, which is less about like trying to instrumentalize it and more about trying to find ways that like we already are all ready. We are already all know how to do this. So we just I need think, to make I think room. that's a perfect seg segue now to just open it up to the audience and have some questions out there. Thank you. So, no questions. Back there. Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, Greg Van Alstein from OCAD University. Uh, one one um, model that popped into my head in the discussion of impacts, which I thought was really, really interesting, is, um, b well, biology, um, or ecology, actually. And um, because we, we can't control what happens uh, at a granular level. But there's, there, there are influences and impacts that have to be thought about. And the rewilding is a concept in that sphere, which I just landed on when you were talking about how much can we anticipate or how much should we care about where it goes. Like uh, wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone Park, I think, because uh, they had been you know, exterminated. And it changed the entire landscape over time because of the way the, the, the whole 
predator chain. Essentially, new trees grew up because the deer weren't eating the trees anymore because they were scared that the wolves were going to kill them and so on. So um, my question is, do we not need to have at least some sort of high-level theory about the kinds of uh, multiple chains of impacts when we, if, if we're going to talk about this in the context of social innovation, don't we have to talk about the social goods and include them in some part of the discussion? Like, do you have, does it have to be exported to the art criticism or the social science, social sciences, or can we not integrate it into the art practice? And I know, I know many of you are doing it in one way or another, but I guess I'm saying from that point of view, does that kind of, like, does the notion of rewilding, which goes after a general goal, but still does the uh, rampant, like, kind of, let's get people up and doing what they naturally want to do, so to speak. Does that offer a way to integrate uh, those seemingly uh, frictiony ideas? Oh, uh, yeah, for me, again, I think the question goes back to, to the ethics of practice, because um, the, the whole notion of the fetishization of the artist, the artist as being the supreme being, um, and the uh, and and the commodification of that of practice that is in direct relation to society as well, which is a product of our neoliberal world, and we've seen throughout art history that art products end up becoming commodities. And now we're seeing that social practice or socially engaged art or art for social change, all these things are now also becoming commodities that organizations can purchase from an artist or from an organization. And the whole rhetoric around impact comes out of this notion of evaluating what is the use or value of that commodity. Um, and so the whole process around um, valuation um, as a risk of impact assessment, so when foundations are asking for measures of success and for measures of impact, often, or not often, but occasionally, sometimes, there is the risk that the project itself ends up being uh, compromised ethically because of this need to answer to the uh, the impacts question. So, so there's I think this whole circle as well. But I think um, further. So, so that's an aspect also of the ecology of the rhetoric around um, this neoliberal world, this sort of commodification of, of artistic um, practice. So anyway, I don't know where I was going with with all of that, but. Uh, I still think that it's, there's, a, there's a huge um, threat to, uh, to artistic practice if we insist on an impact um, focus. But somebody else maybe can answer this question properly. I'm no, I think you did very well. I think we all are actually on the same point on that, is that artistic practices shouldn't be forced into one direction. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it all comes down to uh, I guess your own code of ethics and, and own feelings of responsibility, right? So I, my point is just that I don't think artists have any more or less responsibility than any other population, and, but everybody's own take on what kind of responsibility we should have will vary greatly, right? I mean, that just comes down to your basic philosophy. I do take issue with the idea of responsibility being conflated with neoliberalism. I think people had ethics and responsibility prior to neoliberalism, and but they were it, different. They're sure, but I mean, like, just because everybody else isn't taking responsibility, like, to your point, like, if companies are wrecking the world, doesn't mean like we should be like, oh, okay, well, fuck it. So, let's all do the same thing, right? Like, yeah, like, yeah, but <laughs> nothing I'm saying is like wreck the world. I mean, I'm, there's a no, difference it's a, between. It's a level like, of like, where do you where you draw the line, right? Like, what is your ethical boundaries and what are your are your responsibilities? I'm just saying, as an artist that like there's there's no such thing to me as an artist card right like your responsibility is just as much responsibility as whatever you hold other people to right and so if you think you can make change and you want to make change then do that but don't assume that what you're doing is having that impact and and if you're putting something out there in public that can be potentially harmful if you have any code of ethics around that then you should be conscious of it uh, if you don't then you i mean i it's, that's up to your own moral code, right? And, and just a quick interjection. I think one of the responsibilities of the artist is, in fact, to the point, if you're going to do a project about putting wolves back in Yellowstone, which I know wasn't, artist, wasn't an artistic project, if it was, then engage the experts, work with the community, work with the people who have the knowledge around that so you can do it in a responsible fashion. Um, I, I, I can't believe that, sorry, I can't believe that I'm actually saying this in this point, but. 
Um, I think part of this, dis uh, this disagreement is perhaps too theoretical. There's a real factor, which actually imply applies here when we're talking about the role of art and creative economies and social change, is this issue of it being co-optable and co-opted often. Right? So you can't simply assume that you're doing a project and you have a personal scope of doing stuff without it being bought up by companies or bought up or, or being co-opted. Like, the part that I'm particularly interested in, in taking this notion of rewilding, right, is how do you allow for that resistance to a structure, to an ecosystem? Like, ecosystems, by their very nature, are supposed to co-opt and be viewed from a global, this, this way and seen as that all oppositional forces are all part of the same sort of thing. But is there actual true resistance? Or are we just taking a kind of co-optable resistance to something? And I think that's where this idea of taking individual stock and being open to be able to take individual stock becomes valuable, as opposed to coming up with a theory that, which then just co-ops the whole thing. Yeah. Here, here. We have a question over here. Um, what is your definition of equity, and how do you incorporate it into your everyday practice in a tangible way? Are you talking about equities as in uh, things of value, or are you talking about equitable world? Um, I think equity and diversity, I think we touched on accessibility um, earlier, like who's at the table, whatever your concept of equity is, if you have one, maybe you've heard of one, maybe you, you have a, something you'd like to aspire to, yeah. um, or you're actually enacting on something. I, just, I can speak very quickly to that as somebody who you know, produces and directs and often is responsible for the allocation of resources, um, I take a very personal responsibility. And the way I usually define it is my own blind spots of what I'm taking for granted um, when I'm choosing things often. And again, I have this continuous conversation where I refuse to look at anything except for the work itself. And then I have to be like schooled on some stuff that I'm ignoring and things like that. But generally, it changes every single time I'm looking at projects and choosing or talking to artists or, to, or thinking about a festival. It has to be my own blind spots of what it is that I'm missing and points of view that I'm not taking in. But I don't have a general, personally, I don't have a general framework for that. I'm reluctant, reluctantly taking us back to impact. Um, I spoke recently at a conference in Melbourne called uh, The Spectre of Evaluation. Um, I, I would like to suggest that it's not a but, but it's an and. When we're talking, and, and there will be co-optation no matter what, it will happen. For me, the key is who is the evaluation for? Why are you doing it? And what do you expect to get out of that process? Who's involved in the evaluation? Do you set up some sort of template at the beginning of a project and you mediate it throughout the course of the project? The reality is that artists have to evaluate their work to get funding now. Most artists do. And so um, what we're advocating at the moment is a whole series of, of ways of looking at impact. It's a, it's a global issue that we call it mixed methods. What, for whom, and why. And there are templates, there are methodologies that we can adapt for our own use. So I would suggest that we think about this as an and and not a but. The harsh reality is that we live where we live and if we're going to get uh, uh, support for our work, this, in many cases, has to be an element of what we do. And the partnerships with people outside of our field is often a very good way to go, people who are experienced in these practices. And there are people like that. M sorry, may, may I offer a counterpoint to that, though, is that um, it's uh, going back to the notion of intention, right? Mm -hmm. What I've found in the projects that I've done in the city and outside of the city is that they can be they fall they can fall under the rubric of something very very general, whether it's economic development, where it's community engagement. When I was in school, it was like student experience. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there are these broad pots mm -hmm. that somehow we can sort of fit in mm -hmm. and go with. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I, when, I talk, when I think about impact, so much of the project, many of the projects that I've done or we've done, 
are not often featured in the arts section, they're featured in the business section or the GTA section or something like that. There's something by the very nature of doing something in public space, um, is a, brings a multidisciplinarity. So you don't have to necessarily structure an intention, an impact goal and all that. You can kind of carry along with other existing things, which kind of gives you a certain amount of freedom, perhaps. It's packaging. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. That was a lovely conversation. Great. Thank you.